Grace and peace be unto you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. We might be the only ELCA church that read that text today. Uh, we are actually, deviate, we've deviated from the lectionary. About three months ago, we just decided we were going to try and read the whole Sermon on the Mount uh, during January and February, so we are out of alignment with uh, what everyone else is reading. It's almost as if God said, Good Shepherd should hear that text today. Good Shepherd should hear that text. I want to give you two images to consider as we dig into the words of Jesus. Both involve uh, long bars. So hang with me. Uh, there's a great event in track and field called the high jump. The essence of the high jump is incredibly simple. You set a bar at a certain height, and you, people come and they try and jump over it. If you succeed without knocking it over, uh, you go to the next round. If you clear the bar, they'll just keep raising the bar over and over. Sixty or more years ago, the tradition ha was that you would run forward and launch yourself head first over the bar and kind of straddle it with your legs, sort of like jumping like Superman. Okay? Everyone jumped like Superman to do the high jump. Everyone until a man named Dick Fosbury. Dick Fosbury discovered he could go way higher by being an outlier, by doing it in a different way. He dared to be different. And as a result, it led him to win the gold medal in the 1968 Olympics. But he was the very, very first person who sprinted toward the bar, kind of curved as he went up there, and then he leaped backwards, backwards, to go over the bar and land on the map. His technique, as Marlon said behind me, was called the Fosbury flop. It's the way every high jumper does it today. Every high jumper asks themselves, how high can I possibly go? How high can I soar? Every high jumper wants to elevate themselves to new heights. They strive to go beyond the bar of what others think possible. The second bar is, uh, is one I think a lot of the kids from Vacation Bible, who, Bible School have experienced when I've led games. Uh, when I led games for VBS, kids would come into Shepherd's Hall. We'd always have music going as they arrived. I'd have two helpers holding a long bar, and the kids would start by doing the limbo dance. The limbo dance, you know how it goes. Folks go through a line, they uh, duck under the bar, when all go through, you lower it, they all go through, and you keep lowering it and lowering it and lowering it. At some point, it gets so low, it's almost on the ground. The kids uh, just start stepping over it. <laughs> and it becomes just the tiniest hurdle. They, it takes them no effort whatsoever. And they all say, this is so easy, so easy. So two bars with two questions. How high can I go? And how low can I go? One takes an Olympian effort. The other becomes a really easy task. The tiniest of hurdles where one doesn't break a sweat. Jesus announced to his people, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you something different. You have heard it said is all about the low bar stuff of the world, the tiniest hurdles the baffling things humanity can do with incredible ease. It's about the things humanity can do that to lets itself off the hook. But I say to you, is about the things spiritual Olympians strive for. That's what we strive for. Think about the low bars, the tiny hurdles that are so easy. Because we have so many people in our world who easily go incredibly low. We have PhDs in incivility. We have folks who fan the flames of hatred, division, and bitterness. We have people who demonize those who disagree with them. It's so easy in our world to say something negative about another person, either out loud or in our heart. Never underestimate the power of what's in your heart. It's so easy to think we're right and everyone else is wrong. It's easy to ignore other people and filter them out. It's easy to live in our own personal bubble. So easy in this day and age to spread negative energy on social media, in person, behind people's backs. 
If you think about those things, clearing that hurdle is a piece of cake. But if you clear those hurdles, does it bring any joy to the world? Does it bring any healing? Does it bring any hope? Does it bring any love? Does it bring peace? And I think the answer is no. It just leaves countless people hurting in the wake. And I, I want to be real clear. There's no political party. There's no politician. There's no sports team. There's no amount of money. There's no human experience. There's no possession that can ever totally fill the human heart. The only thing that can fill the human heart is Jesus himself. Only Jesus can love us and those that we think are not lovable. He loves us and other people despite their flawed ways. Yet in love and compassion, Jesus is the one who always calls us and other people and says, I have a better plan for you. So come, listen, follow me. Follow me to the uncommon life, to an extraordinary life, to a life that soars beyond what you think is possible. Think of the transforming words Jesus said to his disciples. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Go the extra mile. Turn the other cheek. What would actually happen if, if, if we embraced what Jesus said there today? I, I think we would elevate humanity all around us to a whole new way of living. We'd become spiritual Olympians striving for incredibly wonderful things. We would discard the need to always have the last word, to always be right. We'd not worry about getting even anymore. We'd become this calming presence for the people around us. We'd go the extra mile, but to go the extra mile to show others a different way of living, we'd live with humility. We would not be arrogant in any way. We'd always be ready to serve, not waiting for other people to serve us. We'd go out of our way to bear witness to peace. We'd end the cycle of violence. We'd show that we fully believe that goodness is stronger than evil and love is stronger than hate. And I think we'd become people of great prayer. So easy to, to say prayers rotely. But you realize if we prayed what Jesus said today, we'd be praying for those we struggled with. We'd be praying for their transformation. But you realize... In praying for others' transformation, you're also praying for your own transformation. If we embrace Jesus' teaching, we would seek always to bless other people, wish them well, wish that they discover their God-given goodness. If we could bless people that way, we would also discover something about ourselves. world doesn't need Christians who stay incredibly low. The world needs us to be a living witness to new possibilities. The world needs you and I to soar to new heights. You know, and I always am inspired by those who soared in their day. Uh, people like, you know, in the civil rights in the 50s and 60s here in the United States, some were calling for open revolt and revenge. And what did Martin Luther King Jr. point to? Matthew 5, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. South Africa, during the era of apartheid, some called for violence and radical overthrow of the government. Desmond Tutu stood up time and time again, says, we are better than this. Love will reign. Goodness is stronger than evil. When England uh, was a part of the slave trade, when many people accepted it as the way it was and would always be, there was one solitary voice named William Wilberforce who had a transformation of the heart and said, we can't do this anymore. It's tearing apart who we are. And he slowly but surely gathered on other people on his deathbed, they voted to get rid of the slave trade once and for all. Let me just say, or ask you, uh, when Jesus said something, was he kidding? Or did he really mean it? Did he really mean it? Any disciple of Jesus knows that when he speaks, he means what he says. He intends for us to follow it. And I think in every generation, he would look at us in the eye and say, you're better than this. So strive for something even greater. Amen. Please stand.